But I want to start this morning with a message series, and this one's a little bit different. It's going to be a little bit of a, a teaching or instruction, but I, I want to bring it to you because I think it's important for us to hear in this time that we're in. And so the message today is called The Horse and the Rider. The Horse and the Rider. And today I'm going to be talking about the white horse. And I want to start out this morning by talking about the idea of salvation and what that means. Now, we know as believers that salvation is one, when one gives your heart to Christ. The Holy Spirit becomes alive inside of you. Your spirit is reborn. You're a new creation. But salvation encompasses more than just this initial saving that happens. Salvation encompasses peace, provision, protection, all of the promises of God for his children, which the Bible says are yes in Christ and yes and amen. And so, as a believer, there is a saving. There's a salvation that scatters the enemy. This declaration of peace, this declaration of protection, this declaration of provision that God has given us so graciously through his son, that declaration scatters the enemy. There is power in the blood of Jesus Christ that causes the enemy to flee. There's power in the name of Jesus that causes the enemy to shudder. And the Bible says that every or one day, every knee, every knee will bow and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Yes, even Satan himself, everybody, Satan himself will bow and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Think about that for a second. Think about all the things that he's brought against you, all of the ailments, all of the challenges. They all bow to the name of Jesus because he bows one day to his name. With salvation, when you get saved, there comes this inheritance from the Lord, something that we receive. That is all of the things that God has for his children. Not only in heaven, which would be enough. Amen? If heaven were the only thing that we received when we got saved, that would be enough. You guys aren't, I, I don't think you're is. If heaven were all that we received, that would be enough, everybody. To, to know that you get to spend eternity with Jesus Christ and walk streets of gold and live in a mansion, right? That would be enough. But there's so much more things that he has given us while we are here on this earth. But here's what I'm here to tell you this morning. The devil's initiative is to rob you of that inheritance. He wants to rob you of that. Now, for those who don't believe in Christ, they're robbed. They don't even realize the deception that's happened. But for those who are in Christ, he wants to take you and take the things that are yours and rob you of them. And he does this through a lot of different ways. He does it through addiction. He does it through fear. He does it through circumstances in your life. And he robs you of the promises of God. He wants us to either be blinded entirely, not realizing what is ours in Christ, or he wants us to go astray and forfeit the things that Christ has for us. The enemy of the children of God, I want you to understand this, the enemy of the children of God is the enemy of God. And God does not take kindly to his children being attacked. Think of your own children. How do you feel when someone mistreats them? How about when they fall sick? You see, to the degree you love your child is to the degree that you hate whatever it is that's hurting them. How much does God love his children? He gave the most precious thing he had for us. So how much does he hate the things that are trying to destroy his children? Mainly, he hates sin. Sin. 
because sin separates us from God. But he also hates sickness. He hates disease. He hates death. None of those things were ever part of his plan for you and I. But they entered because of sin. And just as a good parent would defend and protect his child, God will defend and protect his children. Look at what the Bible says in Psalm 68, verse 1. Let God arise. Let his enemies be scattered. Let them also that hate him flee before him. When God arises over you, your enemies are sure to flee. So in these days that we're living with this idea of the horse and the rider, many people are wondering, is this the end? Are we in the end times? Are these the last days? And I want you to look at something today in the book of Matthew, chapter 24, verses 4 through 8. And I want to start there and take a moment to kind of lay this out for you. But it says, And Jesus answered unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled. For all of these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nations shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. And all of these are the beginning of sorrows. Now, I want to give this to you in a bite-sized portion today. The first thing that Jesus talks about or warns of is false teaching or a false Christ. Now, there surely will be an antichrist, a person, an antichrist who promises peace but does, and brings it for a period of time, and then it goes away. All right? There will be an antichrist. But also, we need to look at this idea of false teaching. Because for today, what we're seeing, what we're hearing, is what we would call to be false teaching. What would that be? If I were to define false teaching for you, I would define it this way. Any message that does not point to Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ only for salvation is false. Any message. Now, I know there are some people who are going to say, well, that's not very nice. We have a lot of friends and some other different types of things that they're doing that, listen, if you're talking about Jesus Christ plus this, it doesn't work, everybody. And it's not this plus Jesus either. It's got to be Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. So anything aside from that, any message aside from that, to me, is false. Is false. Because Jesus said there is no other way by which man can be saved. No man comes to the Father except by me, Jesus Christ. There is no other way. Jesus also addresses rumors of wars and wars. Now, this can be literal, and we are seeing these things increasing, especially right now, right, with the conflicts that are happening in places like Ukraine. But don't be afraid, as he says. Don't be troubled. Remember, here's something that when I look at things that are going on in the world, it gives me hope sometimes, even though it's not a hopeful situation. Why? Because the things that are going on in the world have to happen in order for other things to come to pass. Okay? So in order for Russia to be a dominant force that comes down from the north and attacks Israel, they have to position themselves to do so, everybody. Guess what we're seeing? We're seeing positioning happen. So when we look at these things that are taking place, you can say, wow, this is, and it is a tragedy that people are losing their life. But it's also looking at your Bible and saying, this is what Christ said would happen. Now, they're not invading Israel right now. They will. They'll come against Israel from all sides. 
But you're starting to see these pieces go into place. These things are being set in motion. Wars, rumors of wars. It wasn't a week ago I heard people throwing around World War III. You've got balloons flying over the, you know what I'm saying? Wars and rumors of wars. But today it also looks like this for the believer. It looks like trials and tribulations. Think about how many different things cause stress in your life today. Inflation, that's causing some stress. A general distrust in the government. Talks about famine, scarcity, pandemics. There will be an uptick of stressors on humanity during the last days. The Bible says men's hearts failing them because of fear, which is why Jesus said, don't be afraid. Don't be troubled. He also said, don't be deceived. You know, in many ways, life today is easier. It's, it's the easiest life as far as what we have, our accommodations, all of the commodities we have. It's the easiest life of any civilization that's ever lived, ever. I mean, we have everything that will do everything for us. Automation, artificial intelligence, all of these things that do everything for us. Computers, all of that. You know, even in the workplace, everything's going robotic. Where I used to swing a hammer, now I'm pushing a button, and the robot does it, right? That's what they're trying to get to. So I'm saying we live in a, in a time when we should be at the most ease we've ever been. But we are a people who are the most stressed, unhappy, and unsatisfied of any generation that's ever walked the face of the earth. There are so many people today who appear to be okay on the outside, but they have a war going on in their mind on the inside. So what do we do in the midst of these trials and difficult times? We look to Jesus Christ, our Savior, our salvation, the salvation that scatters the enemy. Jesus speaks of famine, starvation, literally not enough food. But what about for the believer day to day? What does it look like? Remember I said the devil wants to rob things from you. This is what it looks like today. It looks like lack in your life. Now that can be financial lack. It can be provisional lack. It can be relational lack in your life. Lack is not part of the inheritance, everybody. Children of God, lack is not part of your inheritance. Not having what you need is not part of your inheritance. I could go for several minutes today going through what the Bible says about why lack isn't part of it. First of all, David said, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not lack. And my God shall supply all of my needs according to his riches in glory. Right? I can keep going. Lack is not part of the Christian life. Poverty is not part of the Christian life. Well, pastor, you're just being one of those health and wealth gospel preachers. No, I'm not. No. Here's the thing about poverty. I was talking with one of our brothers at Bible study. Today, poverty looks different than it used to. Poverty used to be the gap between what you had and what you needed. And today, the way that we view poverty as a society is the gap between what you have and what you want. Now, come on. It used to be the have and have nots. I don't have enough food to put on my table. That's poverty. I don't have the food that I need. I don't have the shelter that I need. But this idea of I don't have a 70-inch flat screen TV, so I'm in poverty, that's not poverty. That's the gap between what you don't have and what you want, not what you don't have and what you need. And Paul said, my God will supply all my needs needs okay now does god also give us the desires of our heart yes there are things that we want he gives to us but i'm trying to get to you today what we're looking at lack is not part of your inheritance because you are called to be a blessing 
You're called to be a blessing. Look at your neighbor. Say, you're called to be a blessing. That's why you're here on this earth. God blesses you so you can bless others. Lack can't be part of that equation. If it is, someone sitting beside you might be blessing you. Amen? Okay? But he wants to bring a sense of lack over God's people and over the people of the world. Next, pestilences and earthquakes. Pestilences and earthquakes. We're experiencing a lot more of these. First of all, pestilences we don't really have to get into. Gosh, we went through two years of pestilences. All right? Now they're talking about this and that and the other and all these different things. Now they've got all these different, you know, this pox, that pox. Pestilences. Be not deceived. Pestilences. Great earthquakes. Great earth earthquakes. The meaning behind this, measuring eight or more on the Richter scale. Those are great earthquakes. All right, a little rumble in Ohio because of, the, you know, the, where they did the, the, the mining and, the, you know, had a little rumble there. That's not a great earthquake. I'm talking about great earthquakes are eight or higher on the Richter scale. Now, for the believer, what does this look like day to day, though? It looks like this. It looks like sickness and disease. It looks like strife and stress. Remember, sickness and disease were paid for in the body of Jesus Christ. Surely, the Bible says, he has borne our sicknesses and carried our pains by his stripes. As Peter said, ye are healed. So when Jesus addresses these things, as I said before, let God arise and let his enemies be scattered. Is God the first thought that arises when something comes up against you? Because that's what the Bible is saying to do. Let God arise, not fear. Some of us struggle with that. Something comes up and immediately what rises up in us is fear. The Bible says don't be afraid. I want you to turn, please, to the book of Revelation chapter 6 for a moment. Because this is about the horse and the rider today. And I want to talk about the first horse that we see unveiled in Revelation chapter 6, 1 and 2. And it says, And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. Now, I want to talk a little bit about the white horse today. Jesus talks about the idea of a false Christ, an antichrist in the book of Matthew. And I want you to consider all of the different types of teachings that have taken place over the last few years. Remember when we went through, that's rhetorical because most of you do, the pandemic a few years ago. And we had all of these people, and they were quoting Scripture. People that probably, I, I know there were people, it's like, I don't even, I didn't even know you owned a Bible. But you're quoting Scripture and misquoting Scripture using Scripture out of context to either bash someone or praise them for their actions. Do you, you remember that that was going on? Like, like the Facebook post that said, if you really love your neighbor, you will do this. Jesus would have done this. And of course, we had all of these instant experts in the book of Romans. I mean, they knew what submit to your governmental leaders meant because they had studied that their whole life, all of the Greek. They knew exactly the context of what they were saying. There's a little bit of sarcasm this morning. Now, there's a lot of truth in the scriptures that they were quoting, that they were saying, but their knowledge of that truth, I think, was very limited. And it doesn't really matter. I'm talking today about the false teachings that are taking place. I'm talking about priests that are allowing drag shows to happen in their church. 
Now, come on, everybody. And talking about how it's okay. We should be open to allow this to happen. Transgender priests in the Church of England. Inclusive churches. False teaching about... Now, I'm, I'm going to get some emails about this. False teaching about gender identity. Do you know the Bible says God made them male and female? Again, again, false teaching, if it's not pointing to Jesus Christ, but it has to follow his word. It has to line up with his word, not with what you want it to, to say. God made them male and female. Sexuality. Even the inclu exclusion of Christ himself. Like, just completely leaving Christ out of the picture. That makes things a lot easier if we leave Christ out of the picture. And we just come together and we sing some songs and it's all inclusive. We exclude the blood of Jesus because we don't really want to talk about sin. And we don't need the blood of Jesus if there's no sin. So we don't talk about sin. So that means we don't need Jesus Christ. We don't need his blood. We exclude him. We, ex we, we create this environment of perversion and deceit. And Jesus said, don't be deceived. But my pastor at church is saying, we just are supposed to love everybody and accept everybody and do all of this. Don't be deceived, everybody. Yes, Jesus said to love one another. Jesus accepted people. He didn't ask them to change. But listen, again, as I said last week, he never compromised his holiness. And when they left his presence, they didn't leave the same as when they came. If they did, like the rich young ruler, okay, it wasn't a happy time. So I want to take a second to look at this first horse that's mentioned. It says that it was a white horse, a white horse, white representing peace, right? White is a, a, a color that we use to represent peace. Now, what this is, is it's a false peace that's presented to us. It's a false idea of we're going to have peace. And when things transpire and when we have what is called the Great Tribulation, there will be a time of three and a half years of peace, of peace, but it's a deceptive peace. Because after that time period, it's going to be a time like this world has never seen before, of hurting, pain, you talk about, you want to talk about tyrants and you want to talk about this and that and vicious rulers and, and not being able to do anything and not having any rights. That's what you're going to see. You're going to see destruction, hurt, and chaos like this world has never seen before. It would make World War II look like a cartoon. And I'm not speaking lightly of those events. I'm just telling you that what it's going to transpire it's a false teaching. And when we think about false teaching, we think about this antichrist person. It's a beautiful picture. The horse is white. It symbolizes peace. The antichrist brings apart a temporary peace. He brings it about, but it's false. It's a curtain that hides the coming three and a half years. And today, what does this look like for us? It looks like this. It looks like the promise of peace in a message that we're hearing. The ability for everybody to just unite. All religions, all creeds, uniting. But it's an illusion. It's a curtain. It's not real. It's false. It's deceptive. God to the Christian is not the same as God to the Muslim. He's not the same as God to the Hindus, nor is he the same as the God to the Buddhist. The gospel is exclusive in that it pertains to only one God, Yahweh. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. However, the gospel is inclusive as to anyone who believes in that God, in the God, the only God. Anyone who believes from any nation, from any tribe, and from any tongue can have eternal life. 
But the false idea of we can all just get together, we can have this one world, one church thing, it does not work. It will not work. But the idea that this brother or sister from this part of the world can know the God, the only God, the living God, and get saved and become part of the church of Jesus Christ and become a born-again believer washed by his blood, that is real. That is real. And I'm all for that. The Bible says in the book of Revelation that I saw, I looked and I beheld a multitude greater than the eye could see of every nation, every tribe, and every tongue. That's the peace. That's what we're looking for. But do not be deceived by the messages that you're hearing. Now, this white horse also has a rider, the horse and the rider. It's not just sent off by its own. It has a rider. And the rider on this white horse has a bow. It's an appearance, but it's false. It's an appearance that what someone is preaching is correct, but it's false because there is no arrow. Notice that there are no arrows mentioned. A rider with a bow, no arrows. There's nothing in the message that pierces through the heart of the man to save him. There's nothing to, to execute the words that are being spoken. It's all smoke and mirrors and deception. There's an appearance of seriousness, but there's nothing to back up what the person is saying. Without Jesus Christ, the church is an empty bow. You can proclaim love. You can, you can do whatever you want. You can sing the hymns, but without Jesus Christ, the church is an empty bow. It's an illusion. It's a deception. And God forbid you're doing that and deceiving people into believing that they can be a child of God without accepting Jesus Christ, without being washed by his blood. That's deception. Woe unto you that cause any of these little children to stumble. Well, pastor, if, they're, if false teachings are, are so empty, why do they captivate like they do? Listen, if someone aims a bow at you with no arrow, it's going to catch your attention at first, right? I mean, unless you're just knowing that they don't have anything on them. If I had a bow underneath the pulpit here, and I pulled it up and drew it back like that, okay, most of you would flinch. Some of you wouldn't, but most of you would be like, whoa, what's going on? It catches your attention. He's got a bow. What's happening? This is captivating my attention right now. It'll captivate your attention for a moment. But what is it going to do without the arrow? And this is where people, you'll hear them say, well, this church is good and really nice, but I want something more. I want something more than what I'm hearing. What they're wanting is the arrow. They're wanting the arrow. They want something to reach out and hit them, to speak to them, to impact them. And nothing does this like the Word of God, like the Holy Spirit, like Jesus Christ. No word of man can speak to the heart of man the way that Jesus Christ can. And what they want is they want someone like me to stand up here and not give you all of these fluffy words and talk about this philosopher and that philosopher. They want to hear the word of God presented so that when it's spoken, the Holy Spirit bears witness with that word. It penetrates the depths of their heart and it changes their life. If you don't, you might want to find some other place to be, I, I guess, right? Because that's what you get here. The devil wants the believer to feel this way about the things that he brings against you. He brings a sickness. Listen, it's the bow. It's the bow, but there's no arrow behind it. He brings a fear into your heart. It's the bow, but there's no arrow. For those who have eternal life in Christ, 
I will tell you this, that you will never feel more alive than when you're dead. Well, that's morbid, Pastor. I'm just trying to tell you. You will never feel more alive than when you die and you pass away and you go on to be with, with the Lord. The Bible says the believers shall not die with those sleep, but you know what I'm saying. Because the moment you step into eternity, you will feel more alive than you have ever felt before. No pain, no hurting, no sickness, no stress, nothing, no encumbrance, nothing. You will feel more free and more alive than you have ever felt in your entire life. No headaches, no joint aches, no anxiety. You can eat, you won't gain weight. You'll never have felt so good as when you step into eternity. But the devil wants to bring, while we're here on this earth, a, a fear into your heart. He wants to bring you to a place of fear so that you're no longer able to compel others by faith. But remember, the bow without the arrow is really no threat. It acts like a threat. He wants it to feel like a threat to you. Some of these things that we've went through and, and the church has gone through and the world has gone through and the devil's presenting these things and these are a threat to you. These are a threat to you. These are a threat to you. Listen, if you have Jesus Christ... He says, I am your shield and your buckler. I am your rear guard. That means your rear end's covered, right? I mean, he goes before you. He walks alongside you. And as we continue this series, I want you to remember the first thing that Jesus says. He says, do not be deceived. Don't be deceived. When it comes to these false teachings, when it comes to these, these things that you're hearing, don't let yourself be deceived. The Holy Spirit gives wisdom and discernment. Keep your spiritual eyes open wider than your natural eyes. Don't be so distracted by what's happening in the natural that you miss out on what God is doing in the supernatural. Listen, we want to make sure that we are giving people the truth that will change their life. That we give them the truth that will make an impact in their life. There are a lot of great speakers, motivational speakers, encouraging speakers. You can sit and you can listen to them and they can speak about things in your life and they can tell you stop doing this and start doing this and there's always one of those things right it's always you got to stop this and start this and usually I'm selling it whatever it is I want you to do but they can do all these things and you can walk out and you can feel inspired and you can feel like you're ready to take on the world but it will all fall it'll fall to the ground but one word, one word spoken underneath the power of the Holy Spirit has the power because it's the arrow. It will penetrate your heart. It'll penetrate your mind. It'll change you. It'll renew you. It'll transform you. And you'll walk away different than you've been before. And that's what we want to give at Beloved Ministries. That's why I don't always, it's not always the flowers and sunshine messages that we have here. Yes, God is love. Jesus Christ gave his life for you. God loved the world. He gave his only son. There is a heaven that you can spend eternity in. You can walk streets of gold. You'll never grow old. You'll never grow old in a land where we'll never grow old. Right? We can do that. That makes us feel great. But Jesus said, don't be deceived. And sometimes you have to have someone in your life that will say that to you, will show you what is going on in the world and be able to reiterate what the word of God is saying. Don't be deceived, everybody. And don't be afraid. The things that are happening have to happen. They have to happen. And you know, to be part of the generation, there are some great generations just in the United States that have come before us, the Industrial Revolution, 
the invention of the, of the, the factories with the, with the lines and the workers and all of those things, the automobile, the generations, the, the roaring 20s and, and, and the, the boomer generation after World War II that came out, all of these generations just in this last hundred years or so. And we get to be part of the generation Think about that. Of all the believers, of all the saints that have come before us, and all of the things they got to do, we get to be a part of the generation where we see things start to happen, where we see things start to come into place, where I believe that we'll see Jesus Christ. Do you understand that? That's exciting. That's exciting. But Jesus also tells us when these things start to happen, he gives us a warning. Hey, listen, I'm war- this, these are going to happen. But he says, you know what? Look up. Look up for your redemption draws nigh. Don't be deceived. Don't be afraid. Yes, these things have to happen. They have to happen. As I said before, the parts have to move, everybody. The parts are moving. Make sure you are listening to messages that are Christ-centered. What I'm saying is this. Make sure that there's an arrow in the bow of what you're listening to. And the Holy Spirit gives you that discernment to listen to someone and say, wait a second, I'm not really hearing a lot of Christ in this message. I'm hearing a lot of your thoughts. I'm hearing a lot of this philosopher or that philosopher or this historian or that historian or this motivational speaker, but I'm not hearing a lot of Christ in your message, all right? Make sure there's an arrow. Allow the Holy Spirit to show you when others come after you with a bow that has no arrow. And you look and you say, okay, yes, it caught my attention, but the Lord has shown me this really isn't a threat to me. This really isn't something I need to be worried about. You have a bow, but you don't have any arrow. All right? So as we move forward in this series, next week we're going to talk about a different horse and a different rider. But I want you to understand the main things behind this. Because when we preach on, when we preach and teach on the end times and the book of Revelation, and the big word is called eschatology, when you preach on that, A lot of times people say, oh, pastor, that's a doom and gloom message, right? You're doom and gloom. No, listen, this is not doom and gloom. Man, this is is praise, and this is looking forward to great things to come for the church. The Bible says the world grows darker and darker, but the church grows brighter and brighter unto the coming of the Son of Man. Okay? These are great times. Don't look at it as the end times or the last days being terrible times. It's great times that we're living in. Great times of great harvest. The horse and the rider. Don't be deceived. Don't be afraid. Be encouraged. As the Bible says, encourage one another and build each other up. That's what I'm doing this morning. Pastor, you can talk about the literal end of the world, the, you know, the, the last days, and that can be encouraging to me? Yes. Yes. Because you're a child of God. Because you're a child of God. And his promises are true. And he said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I shall return and receive you unto myself. Hey, that's good, right? That's good. But if you don't know Christ today, it's not so great. It doesn't have the same, the arrow is not, you know, it doesn't have that same impact. Well, pastor, I don't know Jesus Christ. And I feel like the things that you're saying are going to be really, really awful. And all of these, listen, if you don't know Jesus Christ, as I said before, it's very simple. Because the God I serve, the only God, He says, you know what? Come unto me, you who are weak and heavy laden. I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. He says, believe in me. Believe in my son. Believe that I loved you enough to send him to die for your sin. Believe that he shed his blood on the cross. And if you believe these things in your heart and you say them with your mouth, you shall be saved. 
And then guess what applies to you after that? If I prepare a place for you, I'll come and receive you to myself.